Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we look to you today in that precious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your gift of salvation through your Son, that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Lord, we pray today for our world and for our nation. We pray for the men and women in blue that you would bless them. Father, we pray that you would comfort those who have lost loved ones serving on our police forces over the United States of America. We pray for those who have lost of friends because of the COVID virus and lo loved ones as well. We pray that you would minister to those families and comfort them. We pray for those in nursing homes and in hospitals today and the medical staff that care for them, that you would be with them all. We pray for those who protect us Lord, every day we think of the fires and the various things that happen and the first responders. We ask, O oh God, that you would bless them all and be with our military, Lord. Watch over them and their families. We thank you and we thank them for the sacrifices that they make for us. Bless them, we pray. And then, our Father, we pray for your church. O oh God, we pray that your church will be strong in such a time as this. Lord, we pray that pe preachers will take their stand for Jesus and they'll really do what God wants them to do. Father, we pray that we'll be strong in the Lord in the power of his might and bless those, O oh God, who are sharing your word abroad. We think of our brothers and sisters in Christ all across this world of ours who are suffering. Be with them, we pray. Comfort them, strengthen them. And O oh God, glorify your name as people share your precious word. Bless, O oh God, this man as he preaches the word today, that he might do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture today is from John 4, verses 43 through 54. Three people were visiting and viewing the Grand Canyon. An artist, a minister, and a cowboy. And as they stood on the edge of that massive series of chasms, each one responded with a cry of exclamation. The artist said, Oh, what a beautiful scene to paint. And the minister exclaimed, What a tremendous example of the handiwork of God. And the cowboy pensively said, What an awful place to lose a cow. Each one had his own perspective on the Grand Canyon. I remember well my first view of the Grand Canyon. It was a mass of wonderful, breathtaking, natural wonder. And I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. Prior to my first visit to the Grand Canyon, I have felt that Niagara Falls was the most awesome scene that I had ever beheld. But both the Grand Canyon and Niagara Falls are places I never tire of viewing, and I've been to both of them many times. What we see very often reflects our position on things. Hymn writer Fanny Crosby, who wrote thousands of songs, was blinded at the age of six weeks. She never had any bitterness because of that blindness. Once the minister remarked sympathetically, I think that it's a great pity that the master did not give you sight when he showered so many other gifts on you. She replied quickly, Do you know that had I been able to make one request of God, knowing what I know now, I would have asked that I should be born blind. Why? asked the surprised minister. Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall gladden my sight will be that of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dr. A.W. Tozer said, I have suffered through many a dull and tedious sermon." But no sermon is poor or long when the preacher is showing me the beauty of the Lord Jesus. Since the Son of God first came to earth, responses to him have been varied. And when we consider the horrible and excessive use of his name in vain, it would seem that the masses of humanity have very little respect for the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three elements which we shall note in the text before us. First of all, the reception of the Word of God. And secondly, the request of a hurting heart. And thirdly, 
the response of the Lord Jesus. In verse 43, we read this statement, a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. The prophet has no honor in his own country. This verse is found in all of the Gospels. Jesus is using this statement in reference to himself. From his earthly lineage and his birth, Jesus was not from the area where he was ministering at this point in time. He was now sharing in the area of Cana of Galilee. Though he was raised in Nazareth, he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. However, in Judea, he was not well received. The Samaritans had responded to the ministry of the Lord Jesus, and so did the Galileans. The Samaritans had seen his work firsthand in the life of the woman at the well. Many of the Galileans believed on him because of what they had seen him do in Jerusalem during the Passover feast. One of the best arguments for Christ and for the gospel is Christ's power to transform lives. People may argue with the words of Scripture, but they cannot argue against his life-changing power. What Christ has done for us can be used of the Holy Spirit to cause people to take a second look at Jesus and to look at his precious word. One writer shares, there is little use in telling people that Christ will bring joy, peace, and power if our own lives are full of grumbling and unhappily gloomy marked with anxious worry and frustrated and defeated. If we are going to draw people to the Lord Jesus Christ, our lives must be such that we can say, look at what the Lord Jesus has done for me. People will only be drawn to Christ when they see the positive and lasting effect of the gospel in the lives of those who profess his name. If you're a defeated, downcast, downhearted Christian, you will not make a positive impact for the cause of Christ. While the Samaritans had uh, to hear the truth for themselves, what took place with the woman at the well had the effect of creating a thirst for Christ among her people. And also, though many in Jerusalem were not enthused about Jesus and his ministry, knowing of what he had accomplished there created a genuine desire for him among the Galileans. What God is doing in our own lives ought to be such as to attract people's attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are either stumbling blocks or we are avenues of blessing when it comes to the gospel. Resisting growth in grace Becoming what God wants us to be hinders our witness for the Lord Jesus. If we are negative, if we are nitpicking, if we are grouchy and act like that, we can't expect that others will be drawn to Christ through such a pathetic witness. Failure to fully respond to the gospel and failure to apply that gospel in our lives every day destroys any witness that we might have to the world. This is why I love this song. It says, I want to be like Jesus. And dear friends, that should be our goal because it's only in becoming like the Lord Jesus and living Christ out that people in this world are going to be attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's something in our life that shouldn't be there, we need to say, Lord, take that away. I don't want to be a poor witness. Oh God, cleanse me. May I be the kind of pure vessel that I ought to be and that you want me to be. We are truly receiving the word when we permit God to constantly change our lives through this precious word. The Bible is not only meant to be read and to be studied. The Bible is meant to be lived. We are to live the word of God. I know people of great knowledge of the word from an informational standpoint but they do little about applying that word in everyday life. One of my goals as a pastor has been to apply the word of God, to make application and to see that the people who are under my care do the same. We need to apply this word of God. 
You can know the Bible as history. You can know it as poetry. You can know it as prophecy. But friend, you need to know it personally as a life-changing entity in your life. Let me say it again. The Bible is not only meant to be read and to be studied. It is meant to be lived. If you get nothing else from this message today, please get that. God's Word is meant to be lived. Now let's look at this matter of the request of a hurting heart. Notice what we read in verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Sickness and death are two of the most difficult things for the human family to face. Most people do everything they can to avoid both of these unavoidable challenges. The loss or illness of loved ones creates heartaches that only those who have been there can know. When Jesus returned to Cana of Galilee, he was able to cultivate the seed he planted there when he did his first miracle. The news of Christ being in the region reached the town of Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is on the Sea of Galilee, about 20 miles from Cana. Perhaps the nobleman or official who had come to see Jesus had something to do with the trading that went on in that area. But nevertheless, this man was convinced that if there was any hope for his son, that hope was in the power of Christ. And this is the kind of faith that gets things done. The scripture tells us that the man implored Jesus to come down and heal his son. And the meaning is that he asked him and he kept on asking him. He wouldn't take no for an answer. He was overly persistent and he wasn't willing to give up. This man was continuously and insistently persistent. Sickness and death were about to rob him of the precious treasure of his son. You know, there have been some times in my life and in my ministry when I felt what this man was feeling. There can be that burden that will not let go until the breakthrough comes. The man's request that Christ would come down shows faith in the power of Christ's presence, but perhaps a lack of faith in his promise. The Lord would teach the nobleman and us that his word is as good as himself. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you are spirit and they are life. We sing there is power in the blood, and indeed that is true. I believe there's power in the blood, but there is also power in the word of God. Think about this. Jesus is telling him, what I say is as valid as what I am. The Word is alive. It is a living book, and there is no other book in the world like it. We read in this book that it is quick. That is, it is living, and it is powerful. Quick means that it is alive. Lives have been transformed that have been touched with this Word of the living God. Real Christians read their Bibles. And real Christians endeavor, by God's grace, to live the Word of God. And this is a problem for an unbelieving world because we stand in resistance to many of the things that they want to do. They want to do things that are wrong. They're wrong morally. They're wrong spiritually. They're wrong in every way. God calls for honesty. Jesus responded to the nobleman with some words that were meant to put things in the right perspective. Verse 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. However, the nobleman was not put off by this. He simply persisted. He didn't argue. He didn't discuss. He didn't question what Jesus had just said. His was a one-track mind. Jesus said on one occasion, If your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. And so he said, my son is going to die unless you intervene. He knew that Jesus was his only hope. This man's regard for Jesus was right on target. And dear friends, we need to tell the world today that the only hope for this world is Jesus Christ. He is the only hope for such a time as this. 
Many times we miss God's best and his blessings because we aren't persistent in our pursuit. I do believe that if we are persevering for the wrong reasons, God can reveal this to us. However, persistence is something we find throughout the scriptures. Lessons in persistence are to be found in the life of Noah. Think of Noah out there in the desert building this ark. I'm sure there were people making fun of Noah when he was doing that, but he was persistent. He continued that until the task was completed. It is the same thing in Nehemiah as he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. People made fun of him and told him to come down from there, but he couldn't come down, he said, because he was doing God's work. Faith with persistence is honoring to the Lord. I am blessed to be the pastor of a group of people who joined me in starting a new non-denominational church nearly 23 years ago. We met in a school and a rented facility for six years. We pers were persistent in seeking the Lord for a place to meet permanently. We were persistent in having a facility to call our own. These people made the best of what God had provided. And in six years, he came forth with a miraculous opportunity to have a facility far beyond my and their thinking. God has done great thing for, for us, whereof we are glad. In December of this year, Faith Bible Fellowship will have been in existence for 23 years. And I have been preaching the gospel for 61 years. However, we do well to remember that to exist for 23 years, all you have to do is just not die. Our existence is one thing, but our persistence in getting the gospel out and in seeing people's lives transformed is quite another thing. I like to think of this as a garden where people are blooming for Jesus and sowing seed here and also throughout the world that will bring forth fruit of eternal dimensions and value. The gravitational energy of the whole earth is estimated to amount to only a millionth of a horsepower. A toy magnet in the hands of a child can be thousands of times stronger than that. But what gravity lacks in brawn, it makes up in tenacity. Its reach is limitless shaping and governing the universe across unimaginable chasms of space. Its frail attraction keeps the moon orbiting the earth, the planets revolving around the sun, and the sun along with a billion other stars rotating around the center of our galaxy like a cosmic pinwheel. What does this say to us? It says little is much when God is in it. The impact of a little flock can be mightier than anyone can imagine. From little flocks have come great ministries that have impacted the world for Christ. A little pebble thrown in a pond can cause ripples that reach to the shorelines. So, we are not a mega church, but we are a healthy church. We are a growing church. And by American church statistic standards, believe it or not, we are a large church. However, when all is said and done, if the little churches in America had ceased to exist, there might not even be the mega churches. Many little flocks provided seed that has been spread and is still being spread today. The nobleman refused to be discouraged, and Jesus met him with some very strong words in verse 48. The man did not take offense at what Jesus said. If he had given up on the spot, it would have been evident that his faith had something to be desired. When we overcome that which offends us to believe in spite of our hurt and in spite of misunderstanding of others at our request, we are demonstrating the strength of true faith. I am here today because some years ago, some people stood with me and continued to stand to let God bring us to where we are and where I am with them. Now let's look at the response of the Lord Jesus and verses 50 through 54. Here's what we read. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, 
And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. While what Christ said at first may have been difficult, the intent of Christ was good. The man was undoubtedly strengthened in his resolve for Christ's intervention. The challenge for his faith was not bad, but that challenge was good. The Lord does not challenge us to intimidate us, but rather that we might grow through that challenge. I had a mother who constantly challenged me to do better. If I had not such, had such a mother, I wouldn't be where I am. Can I say that I received her challenges with great delight? No, I didn't. But today I am extremely thankful for that woman in my life who sat on me, who pushed me, who didn't give me much peace and wanted me to excel. Tough love is not at all bad. Pain can mean gain, ultimately. When the nobleman continued his request after his faith was challenged, Jesus' response was immediate, and it was positive. Go your way. Your son lives. And the response of this man was, he believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. Since he was some distance from his home, he could not check on what Jesus said initially, but he trusted Christ's word just the same. In other words, he believed without seeing in contrast to seeing and then believing. What group are you in? Are you in the group that believes the promises without seeing and takes the Savior at his word? I grant you that there are some things that may test our faith from time to time, but our faith should ultimately rest on God's gracious control over all circumstances. The circumstances surrounding our life are no accident. They may be the work of evil, but that evil is held firmly within the mighty hand of our almighty God. All evil is subject to him, and evil cannot touch his children unless God allows it. God is the Lord of human history and of the personal history of every member of his redeemed family. Jerry Bridges, noted Christian author, shares, not only are the willful, malevolent acts of other people under God's control, so also are the mistakes and the failures of other people. What is God telling us through all of Scripture? No matter where you go, what is God telling us? He tells it in the count of creation. He tells it through the histories of individuals. He tells it through his chosen people, Israel. He tells it through the prophets, through the Psalms, through the book of Proverbs, through the disciples, through the life and ministry of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He shouts it through the epistles and declares in the book of the Revelation. What is he telling us? He is telling us, trust me, trust me, trust me. Dear friends, we are living in a time when the faith of many has been shaken shaken to the core, but God is reaching out and he's saying to us today, trust me, trust me, trust me. Lord, I don't like this. Lord, I don't like that. I don't like what's happening in our country. Lord, I can't understand what's happening with the church. And God is saying to us, trust me, trust me. God's going to work out his purposes. Trust me. This man trusted Jesus and his servants met him with a message concerning his son. He already knew that his son was alive. The miracle could be traced to the hour that he believed. The added blessing of this situation was that the whole household came to faith in Jesus Christ. While we focus on the fact that his son was healed, we must remember that at some future time, his son would die. His physical healing did not deliver him from death in the future. The big miracle was not that the son lived but that the entire household of this man came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That was the most important thing of all miracles. The young man escaped physical death for a time, but he and his family 
were saved for eternity. They got on that day when that man believed eternal life. On the other hand, it sometimes takes an incurable illness, a death, some hard circumstance to bring people to where this story ends. We must understand that regardless of what is happening in our world and in our nation and in our politics, God knows what he is doing and whatever he is doing is always exactly and right even if we can't understand it. God rules and God rules well. He is not out to harm us, but he is out to bless us even in the things that may seem to be harmful. What matter if the clouds hang low? What matter if the bleak winds blow? What matter if I may not know the reason why these things are so? God reigns, I will be true. What matter if my friends are few? What matter where they are or who? What matter what men say or do? What matter what God leads me through? He reigns, I will be true. What matter if this life is brief? What matter if we toil or grief? I in my Savior find relief. Of all my joy, he is the chief. God reigns. I will be true. And friends, that's exactly what every child of God ought to be saying. No matter what is going on, no matter what happens, behind all of that, you are there. And you will not forsake your own. You loved us with a love that is eternal, that is everlasting, and there is no love in this world that can match the love of God. It is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It reaches to the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. O oh, love of God, so rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. And we need to understand that. Whatever your need today, friend, I'm here to pray with you. If you've never invited the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, if you're without him, this is certainly the time to do it. Today is the day of salvation. Friend, don't neglect the most important decision you could ever make in life to receive the Lord Jesus, to believe on him. The Bible says to as many as believe in him that they wouldn't perish. He will make them his children and God calls us to faith and trust in him because of his love, because of his grace, and because of his mercy. And if there's anything you need to be prepared for life and for death, it is Jesus, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so, if you're burdened about something or sick and want prayer, I want to pray with you as well. But if you don't know Christ, I want you to join me in a prayer and make these words I pray at first your own. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and please help me to turn from it. I want to repent from it. I want to turn away from it. I want to invite you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to know tonight that when I go to bed, if I should not wake up in the morning, I'll be in heaven with you. Lord, I want to know you and I want to make you known. Please help me, Lord. I ask you into my life today. I receive you as my Savior in your precious name. And then, Lord, we pray for those who are hurting. Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are struggling. Oh, God, that you would bring peace to them. Lord, you want us to have your peace. And indeed, if our sins are forgiven and we know that we're on our way to heaven, we should have peace. But give us the strength we need as believers to go through what we are facing today and what we may yet face. It may get worse before you come. But Lord, may we remain faithful. Minister to those who are discouraged. Lift their spirit today. That one who is down, lift them up by your mighty hand and give them joy in the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.